Welcome back to Paleo Talks, everybody. We are live with you, coming to you from the Center of Excellence in Paleontology at East Tennessee State University. And today we have Peter Unger with us. How you doing, Peter? All right, great to see you. Uh, before we move on to introductions, let's have David tell us a little bit more about the show and how it works again. Sure thing, same as the last few dozen episodes, uh, standard format. Here in just a bit, we'll introduce our guest and then shortly afterwards launch into our main presentation. Today, it sounds like we're talking a lot about teeth and diets, uh, which is a recurring theme on Paleo Talks. After the presentation, uh, we will open it up to Q&A. Our panel here will have some cues and we are, will be taking questions from the audience. So once the presentation is wrapping up, we'll remind you to start sending us your questions in the Facebook comments. And as always, if for any reason you can't leave a Facebook comment, I'll be keeping an eye on the Gray Fossil site, Twitter and Instagram accounts. You can send us questions there as well. All right, thank you, David. And although that has been one of our focal areas for sure, because paleontologists are often working on teeth and diet, this is really our first one where we're talking about humans and uh, human ancestors. So that's exciting for sure. And as usual, we have Dr. Chris Widgo with us. How you doing, Chris? I'm good. I All know right. that proboscideans will come in at some point. Huh. Um, so <laughs> the, the other focus of paleotoxin seems yeah, but, but yes, we, teeth and teeth and bones are good. <laughs> somehow we always end up talking about proboscideans at some point. So actually, if you don't talk about proboscideans, that's also quite all right. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't planning on it. <laughs> Well, it's a real privilege to have Peter with us here today. Peter was my PhD advisor many years ago, so he's been my mentor for a long time. So it's always an honor uh, when I get to introduce somebody like Peter. And Peter, the way we actually move forward with our introductions is people introduce themselves um, and, and not only introduce yourself sort of as to what you're doing now, but how did you get into studying paleontology, paleoanthropology in the first place. Okay. So go, go Peter. All right. Um, can you all see the, are you going to show the screen when we get started? Yeah, we'll show the screen when you get started. Okay. If you could just go ahead and give us your background. Sure. Uh, my name is Peter Unger. I'm a faculty member at the University of Arkansas. Uh, in the Department of Anthropology and the director of the Environmental Dynamics Program at the university. I've been at, at U of A for, well, for a really long time, as you can probably tell looking at the top of Blaine's head um, <laughs> and his lack of hair. I had uh, hair when I started the program and so did Peter. Yeah, you sure, so, so did yeah. I. Yeah. Um, back in 95, I joined uh, the department. Uh, before then, I spent a couple of years at Duke in uh, the Department of Biological Anthropology and Anatomy in the medical school. And before that, I was at Johns Hopkins in cell biology and anatomy, uh, part of their paleontology program. And I got my PhD at Stony Brook University. So I've been in, in, this, in this gig a really long time. And I really became interested in it when I was about five and went to the American Museum of Natural History for the very first time as, as a little kid and saw the dinosaurs and the, the giant blue whale. And, said to myself, you know, I want to either be a paleontologist or an astronaut. And <laughs> I guess I didn't have the math skills to be an astronaut. So here I am. And you do a lot of math in paleo though, too. So I suppose not, not as much as I would have in, in, in uh, <laughs> astronautics though. <laughs> I remember a story that you told me um, because one of our, uh, we've talked about academic lineages before. And, and sort of you've actually written some things up on that. And I remember you met Raymond Dart. Uh, being, you were like the youngest person at the meeting and he was the oldest, is that right? Yeah, um, it was the Ancestors Workshop. And back in 1984, I was an undergraduate. Um, and it was in New York City at the American Museum of Natural History. Got a theme going here. Um, and yeah, I just happened to bump into him in the men's room right I, mean, I pull up to the to the to the urinal and he's standing right next to me and sort of I looked over at him and I I you know had to catch myself from sort of spraying his pants uh just just it was just such a such an incredible it was so amazing to see this sort of father of the discipline and 
was everything I could do to keep uh, keep from introducing myself when we were there right in front of the right in front of the uh, urinals, but waited till he got out. And he was so kind and generous. We sat down right outside of the auditorium and he just told me the whole story of his discovery of the Tong child. Um, and it was, it, was, it was a really, it was one of those special moments that you sometimes get in paleontology. Yeah, yeah it is just so extraordinary. And he is a, an academic ancestor. Um, I remember you know, learning that essentially through the line of, of Fred Grine and Tobias and, and you. Is that and basically? Yeah, yeah, he yeah. would be my academic great grandfather. Your academic yeah. great great grandfather. Yeah, and, and I got to meet him as well, and that was just pretty magical when I was Tobias. In Tobias, that's right, not Dart. I got to meet yeah. Him. Dart was kind of long. Yeah, ago. Dart was definitely I mean, gone. But yeah, if you're if you're not familiar with what we're talking about, you know, look up um, uh, Af you know uh, Australopithecus africanus and the discovery of the Tong child, and it's really sort of a a father of much of this looking at caves and looking at uh, early hominids. So I just wanted to get that story in there. And um, again, it's great to have you. We're coming to you again, reminder, we're coming to you from the Center of Excellence in Paleontology, where we oversee the research at the Gray Fossil Site, uh, a, a 5 million year old fossil locality that hopefully all of you can come and visit at some point. And one of the things I always think about when I think about Gray, because I worked in the, the paleoanthropology world a little bit too, is the fact that when we were at 5 million years ago, you know, here in North America, the gray fossil site, where were we at in terms of hominid evolution, you know, in other parts of the world? And that's a story that I'd like to be able to tell at some point at the museum. Where were we at, Peter? Who, who, was, who was on the uh, sort of the, the, the playing field at that time in early hominids, 5 million years? We were just coming off of the split with chimpanzees. Yeah. That's depending right. on who you ask. Okay. So um, something like Artipithecus, if not Artipithecus. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting to think about. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get you to go ahead and show your, uh, your presentation. You should be able to, to share it. Let me see. Does that work? That works. Go ahead and start walking us through it. All right, sounds good. Well, what I'd like to, to talk to you a little bit about today is the research that I've done and uh, my students and colleagues have done over the years. It's kind of a, a synopsis of some of the work that we've done on dental evidence for the diets of our distant ancestors. Um, it all focuses on teeth. And that's just because teeth are so cool, right? Whether you see them in picture books or natural history museums or, or coming out of the ground at a fossil site, there's something about them, right? Your reaction is visceral. I don't know whether it's because we've spent so much of our evolutionary history running away from them or what, but for whatever reason, teeth are really important to us. And if you wanna know how important they are, well, you don't have to go any further than, uh, than a survey from the online dating service match.com where they asked thousands of singles what the most important asset on a prospective date was. And of course, for both men and women, teeth came up. So from an evolutionary perspective, that just tells you teeth are really important. And when you start to think about it, they're an incredible set of structures, right? Your teeth have to break without themselves being broken up to millions of times over the course of your lifetime. And they have to do it built from the very same raw materials as the foods that are being eaten. So from an engineering perspective, they show us what an incredible design nature can provide. So they're really just cool structures. From my perspective, teeth are important because of what they can tell us about evolution. Just think of the, the multiple myriad types of mammalian molars, right? Uh, and, and, and how they're all seemingly so perfectly adapted to whatever food it is an animal eats. Let's say you are, can you see my cursor? Yes. Let's say you are an antelope, right? And you, you're going to have flat teeth with alternating parallel lines or ridges of enamel for grinding tough vegetation. Um, if you like, uh, like grass, if you're a lion, you'll have sharp bladed teeth 
gold carnassials for shearing or slicing tough meat and sinew. If you're a hyena, you'll have flat, blunt, thickly enameled teeth for crushing bone, perhaps other hard objects. So teeth cannot just tell us about sort of the lifestyle of an animal. It can actually tell us something about that animal's place in nature. But what about our place in nature? Now we can start taking a paleoanthropological, not just a paleontological perspective, and address this question by looking at our teeth. So what I'm going to talk about here this morning, or afternoon, or whatever it is there in East Tennessee, it, we'll start with how teeth work, talk about relationship between tooth shape and diet, and how teeth are used. I'll take an ecological approach. And believe it or not, those are not the same thing. How they work and how they are used are quite different. And I think therein lies the rub. It's not just semantics. Food prints, which is a way of getting at the difference between the two. I'll talk about dental microwear and defined food prints, as I have termed it. Then we'll assemble the evidence and use that to say something about the diets of our distant ancestors. So let's just jump into it and look at how teeth work. The traditional view of teeth, and this actually goes back to George Gaylord Simpson in the early 20th century, is that they're an essentially passive element in the active masticatory apparatus and are dependent on the movements of the mandible for their functional interactions. So Karen Hemi said in the 70s. In other words, teeth are guides for chewing, right? So if you've got flat teeth with parallel ridges of enamel, they are designed for horizontal movements perpendicular to those ridges. Think of a, a, a washboard or a rasp for milling or grinding, say, tough vegetation. If you've got carnassial bladed teeth, they're designed to be used in shearing or slicing like scissors with vertical movements, right? If you have teeth with cusps that fit neatly into base, they're also designed for vertical movements, for crushing and grinding type actions. Could be a, a bear or a, or a person or a pig. So basically the idea is that teeth are passive players in the active game of chewing. Now the other view, uh, which is more recent, is that teeth are really tools for fracture. And we can best explain dental dietary adaptations, according to Peter Lucas, by identifying different forms of food, generalizing about their behaviors under stress, and designing equipment that might operate efficiently to chew that food, to commutate them. This is more of an engineering approach, right? So basically, you start with your food and figure out sort of how the, the, does the food defend itself from being cracked and broken. And that's what teeth are about. They're about fracturing. There's two ways, right? Food can be hard, which requires a lot of work to start the crack, or foods can be tough, which means their defenses are there to prevent the spread of a crack. Now, there's a fundamental challenge here, and that is, if you start to think about it, you start and you spread a crack by pulling something apart, not by pushing it together. When you push something together, you close a crack. You don't form the crack, but the teeth come together. How do you create tension from compression? That's the challenge that teeth face. The answer to that challenge depends on the properties of the foods themselves. So let's say that you have a hard food, like a walnut. When you crack that walnut, you, you create a compression and perpendicular to the long axis of compression, the shell itself, which is being compressed this way, flexes in the perpendicular direction, creating tension, right? That's how that works. Look at it. Next time you crack a walnut, see where it cracks. The best tooth for this kind of job is probably going to be a hemispherical dome, something that minimizes the contact point, which increases the stress because stress is force per unit area, but something that also is sort of dome shaped to protect the tooth itself from breaking. Now, if on the other hand, you are consuming tough foods. And again, tough foods are those that are uh, challenging to pass a crack through, to spread the crack. You want something that looks like a wedge because what, what you'll do is you'll push the wedge into the crack and it'll create tension at the point of the advancing tip. The best tooth form is gonna be a blade 
or a loaf for shearing or slicing through tough foods. But with that said, let's see how close we come to the mark. Here are three primate species, and I'm using primates because that's what most paleoanthropologists use. Uh, closely related old world monkeys, a leaf eating silvery langur, and hard object feeding uh, great cheek magnate, and a soft fruit eating, but pretty sort of broad spectrum dieted macaque monkey. And you'll notice that these forms of the teeth are very similar in some senses, but subtly different in others, and in ways that correspond to the diet differences. Look at the difference in the length of the shearing crests between the tough leaf eater, and you can see my cursor, yes? Okay, and the hard object feeder, which has blunt or flatter teeth. And you'll also see that the soft fruit eater is in the middle. If you can come up with a good way of quantifying, say, crest length, you should be able to stick fossils here and use these to compare with the fossils and say something about diet in the past. The traditional way of doing this was developed by Rich K back in the 1970s and 80s, and it's called shearing quotient analysis. It's very simple and straightforward. You measure the lengths of all the shearing crests running front to back on the tooth, anteroposteriorly or mesiodistally, relative to the length of the tooth. The relatively longer the crests, the more shear potential. Pretty straightforward. And when you plot molar length or shearing crest length against molar length for a group of old world monkeys, similar species, closely related, with a given type of diet, in this case, fruit eaters, um, you get a pretty tight distribution. And this line is basically the expected shearing crest length for a fruit eating old world monkey of a given molar length. The magic happens when you put other primates that are closely related on the same graph that have different diets. As you can see, these are leaf eaters and the leaf eating monkeys have longer than expected shearing crests for a fruit eater. So leaf eaters have longer crests than fruit eaters. And guess what? With a single tooth, you might be able to put a fossil primate species on this distribution and say something about its diet. But that said, there are limits to conventional shearing crest analyses. The landmarks that you use to measure crest length disappear as the tooth wears, which is a problem and can be a challenge. Teeth wear, they change their shape. Not just that, but teeth can be complex three-dimensional structures. And there's got to be more to dental function than simply the lengths of crests. And so years and years and years ago, my students and I developed a technique we call dental topographic analysis, which is a new way of measuring, or new back then, way of measuring tooth shape and its functional, uh, at least functional aspects of it. We started with GIS. Now, for those in the audience who might not be that familiar with GIS, it stands for Geographic Information Systems, and it's a way of relating different types of information that are linked by location in space. The classic example is say a farmer wants to figure out where to plant his crops. How would you do that? Well, you might take a layer of information on hydrology, layer of information on soil type, layer of information on relief or topography, superimpose them, and look for sort of the right combination of attributes to figure out where to best plant. But one thing GIS is really good at is, is, is modeling landscapes right? Mountains and valleys and so forth. And I figured that you could do this to teeth. So got a laser scanner. Today, I actually use an intraoral scanner that's common in most dental offices, but same principle. Create a 3D rendering of a tooth surface and basically model it as a landscape, right? The, the cusps become mountains, the fissures become valleys and so forth. And we can use all the tools available in GIS to characterize quantitatively occlusal morphology. So we could look at the average slope of the surface, the angularity or jaggedness of the surface, which is the second derivative of elevation. We can look at the relief of the surface, the 3D to 2D surface area. And since I did this, other people have come in and developed other uh, approaches to characterizing tooth form. So some people look at orientation patch count, which is the number of contiguous patches of a given orientation which gives you an idea of how many tools 
or how complex a surface is. Dirichlet or Dirichlet normal energy, which is a measure of the curvature of the surface. So there are lots of tools available to get at tooth form today. Um, sort of the, 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 the first study that I did with a, a grad student, Francis Carrera, many, many years ago, was we compared gorillas, chimps, and orangutans. Gorillas in green, chimps in red, orangutans in orange. Uh, gorillas eat the most leaves, chimps the most fruits, orangutans the most, well, a mix of fruits and leaves, as well as other things. And here's surface slope and relief by wear stage, unworn, moderately worn, heavily worn. And three things sort of stick out at you. First, the teeth get flatter as they wear down for a given species, which kind of makes sense. Second, at a given wear stage, gorillas, which are the leaf eaters, the ones that eat the tougher foods, have more sloping surfaces than chimps, which are the fruit eaters, and the orangutans are in between. And third, the relationship between the shape of the tooth and the, the diet, at least for these species, um, holds regardless of the wear stage. So if you can control for wear, you should be able to say something about diet. And I became really interested in how wear affects diet. So I partnered with Mark Tiefert at now at Toro University and Ken Glander, who was at Duke, uh, and went down to Costa Rica. They regularly darted howling monkeys and over the course of 10 years, repeatedly darted howling monkeys and took impressions of their teeth. And so we were able to look at the same individuals over time and how their teeth wore. And what we found was, and this was done with another grad student, um, what we found, uh, De uh, Dennis, um, what we found was that the change in slope occurred sort of continuously and that with more years between observations, there was more change in slope, which suggests the teeth get flatter over time. Same for relief, it makes sense. But for angularity or jaggedness, that stayed really constant over time. And so what we identified here was one attribute that seemed to be that associated with dental function that seemed to be pretty robust to wear, which was really pretty cool. The most recent study that I was involved with, uh, with my students was a study of about 300 monkeys from South America, all from the Para State in Brazil along this one river course, representing a dozen species from this fruit eating squirrel monkey to this gum feeding marmoset to this leaf eating howling monkey to this hard object feeding capuchin monkey. And when you plot out attributes like angularity over orientation patch count, you do get some pretty good separation by diet. Right, The gum feeders separate cleanly from the leaf eaters and the seed predators. The fruit eaters are kind of all over the map though. But what's interesting is when we just isolate the fruit eaters and consider their secondary diets, that is what they eat when, they don't, when they're not eating fruits, there's even cleaner separation, hard object feeders, seed predators, leaf eaters, and insect feeders. So clearly there's something very um, robust about the relationship between tooth form and diet that we can use to interpret fossils. But is it that simple? The relationships between anatomy and behavior are complex and they really depend on the situation. We say that biological structures are often overbuilt for day-to-day -day functioning. So the example that I like to give is this one here. I'm sure this isn't something you see in East Tennessee, um, but just because your car is capable of going 100 miles an hour, it doesn't mean you're gonna be driving that way in the big city during rush hour. But nevertheless, the power can be useful for those few times you have to accelerate to get on the highway. Put another way, let's say that you eat Jell-O 360 days of, out of the year. Doesn't matter what your teeth look like, but if you have to eat rocks five days or you're going to die of starvation, your teeth better be adapted for rocks. What does that tell us about fossils? in our, their interpretation. Well, the best way to check that is to actually go into the forest and look and see how animals use their teeth. The default model, which is the one that paleontologists like, is called the species-specific dietary adaptations model. And um, Bob Sussman came up with this in the 80s. He said that primates will eat 
specific food types, even when they live in different habitats, because the shapes of their teeth and the anatomy of their guts tells them that that's what they should eat. So whether you're looking at um, ringtail lemurs or howling monkeys or vervet monkeys, if they live in different settings, and even if that different members of the species have access to different species of foods, they tend to seek out foods with similar properties, which is good news for paleontologists, of course. But it's not always like this, right? In the real world, things are, work a little differently. I'll give you the example of the um, mangabe monkey. Now, mangabees have big flat teeth, powerful jaws that are evolved or adapted for crushing hard foods. And in fact, the sooty mangabees of the Thai forest and the Ivory Coast actually prefer very hard sacaglottis nuts, which think of apricot or uh, peach pits. They're rot resistant pits on the floor of the forest that are available year round. Nobody else eats them because their teeth won't allow them to. But these guys prefer them and consume them year round. It's an adaptation that gives them an advantage. But we also have the great cheek manga bees, which are closely related and live at Kabali in Uganda, among other places. They prefer soft, fleshy fruits available most of the time. And decades of study by Joanna Lambert has shown that these monkeys only eat hard foods maybe once every seven years when there's extreme drought associated with El Nino events. Otherwise, they'll eat the same thing as the red tailed monkeys that live alongside them, but they have an advantage when they need it, even if it's only once or twice in a generation. So closely related species, similar teeth and jaws, similar environments, but very different food preferences. One more example, how about mountain gorillas? First, we've got the lower altitude mountain gorillas that prefer and consume soft fruits most of the year when they're available. But when they're not available, they'll sort of fall back on tough leaves and stems during those periods of seasonal stress when they have to. Why? Because they've got the teeth to allow it. There's these sharp bladed teeth for shearing and slicing. I guess that didn't, uh, didn't come across, but nevertheless, there you go. Compare these to higher altitude gorillas that have been forced into upper elevation ranges by human encroachment, right? These gorillas always eat lower quality tough foods because there are no fruits in the, in the mist, in the high cloud forests of the Barungas. It's too high up. They always eat lower quality tough foods because again, their anatomy allows it, but they don't have access to the foods that they would otherwise that any sort of self-respecting ape would wanna eat. So here we've got the same species, same adaptive specializations, but different diets because they live in different environments. And this brings up an important concept, one that I call the biospheric buffet, right? I consider the biosphere, that part of our planet that harbors life, it's kind of a giant buffet table. Like you go to a Chinese buffet, you see all the animals bellying up to the sneeze guard with their plates in their hands, picking and choosing from whatever foods are available in a given time, at a given place. Teeth are important. They're the utensils you have to eat with and they limit what you can eat. But the really important part is what's there. And that probably explains more than teeth why chimpanzees eat soft forest foods, whereas geladas living in the open savanna consume grass products. Teeth are important, but they're not what's making the decision as to what's being eaten. So with that said, how can we use teeth to say anything at all about the diets of animals in the past? I use what I like to call food prints, which are like footprints in the sand. They're traces of actual behavior of once living organisms. They do not rely on adaptation or adaptationist assumptions, right? They tell us what the animal whose fossil tooth you hold in your hand ate at a moment in time in the past. And the, they can be isotopes, they can be phytoliths, they can be dental microware, where the microscopic scratches and pits that form on a tooth surface as the result of its use. So if you're a capuchin monkey that crushes hard nuts between opposing surfaces, you might get pits. 
If you are a howling monkey that shears and slices through tough leaves with scissor-like teeth, you might get scratches as the abrasives in those leaves get dragged along the surfaces of the tooth in a given direction. And we should be able to use this to say something about diet. The traditional approach to measuring this, of course, you take a stereo microscope or a scanning electron microscope, and then you count and you measure each and every one of the scratches and pits on the surface of the tooth. There's a scratch, there's a pit, and you sort of populate that. Here we have like 450 plus features on this surface. When you do that, it's a lot of work, and it explains why I have these god-awful reading glasses now. I did it for a lot of years. Um, you get a graph that looks something like this. Here on the y-axis, this is data from Mark Tieford, a ratio of pits to scratches, more pits at the top, more scratches at the bottom. In yellow, we have species that are hard object feeders, green leaf eaters, red soft fruit eaters. And you can sort of see that you get a pattern that looks like what you'd expect. Hard object feeders have more pits, tough leaf eaters have more scratches, soft fruit eaters are in the middle. And you should be able to put values for fossils right on this graph and say something about diet. But just like shearing quotient analysis has its limits, so too does this sort of conventional microware. First of all, instrument settings can have a pretty dramatic impact on what you see, right? Um, and the automation is not working, but trust me when I say, when, uh, when you change the orientation of the electron beam relative to the surface, relative to the collector, or you change the, the angle that, that the light is coming onto the surface, you can get something that's really pity, something that's really scratchy, or something that looks somewhere in between the two. Just as sort of as the sun uh, moves across the sky over the Grand Canyon, what you see in the canyon changes. And that can create noise to the signal. Likewise, um, measurements are not very repeatable. When you've got different people measuring surfaces, you're never gonna get the same measurements twice. Even the same person won't get the same measurements twice. And this noise, it's amazing that it's overcome at all, but it probably limits what we can tell from microware. So my colleagues and I developed something called dental microware texture analysis, where we use an instrument like a confocal pro profiler to create a 3D rendering of a surface and then expose it to texture analyses from engineering. It's fully automated, it's 3D, and it solves the problems with conventional microware analysis. This automated approach called scale-sensitive fractal analysis is especially cool. It, it depends on the concept of surface texture relating to scale of observation. So let's say you're driving along a backcountry road in East Tennessee. Uh, if you're driving along that road, it may seem smooth to you in the car, but to an ant crossing that road, it'll be much rougher. And it's that change in roughness with scale of observation that really gives you the information you want about texture. So let's say you have a surface and you lay triangles on top of it, and then you measure the areas of the triangles, the combined area. As you get smaller and smaller triangles, it gets into the nooks and crannies, and the overall area increases. If you plot your scale of observation, that is your triangle size, against your patch area, the steepest part of the slope is what you define as complexity. And this gives you the important information for diet. There are lots of other attributes you can look at. So for example, anisotropy or anisotropy is directionality on the surface without going into any details on how that's formed. When you've got lots of scratches in the same direction, you'll be more anisotropic than surfaces that have scratches randomly oriented or heavily pitted. And there are other attributes too. Yes, Blade, do you have a question? I just wanted to ask you yeah, a, a question that one of the things that haunted me when I was a graduate student was walking across campus at night and I would see microware surfaces everywhere. And I could classify the sidewalk as a grazer or a browser. And I think I, 
you know, I originally got past that, um, but I wonder if you're still haunted by something similar when you when you, <laughs> when you see and, surfaces. You know, most of this stuff is now done by my grad students. Right. <laughs> but certainly when I was involved with it, I remember um, when I was in grad school, taking the, the ferry between Port Jefferson, New York and Bridgeport, Connecticut, and standing sort of on the deck, looking over into over onto the ocean, onto the Long Island Sound, and I saw it was all micro air surface. <laughs> it was, so yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> all right. All right. So you're going to have simple anisotropic surfaces if you're a leaf eater, more complex isotropic ones if you're a hard object feeder. And this holds whether you're looking at um, howling monkeys or capuchins. And this is from some work that I did with Mark Tiford and, and my postdoc at the time, Rob Scott. Uh, or um, old world monkeys like the leaf or like the, the grass blade consuming gelata or the hard object feeding manca bees we talked about. And thanks to some work done by the likes of uh, Larissa DeSantis and Blake Schubert and, and their students, this seems to be the case across mammalia, right? It's not just primates. Uh, compare a cheetah, which eats lots of tough meat and sinew with a bone crunching hyena. Compare a tough bamboo feeding panda with a more omnivorous black bear. A, a, bra a grazing kangaroo with a browsing wallaby. Even things that don't have an owl, like a leaf eating sloth versus a more omnivorous armadillo. The pattern seems to hold. But the best example I have is this work done by Jessica Scott, former grad student, which are antelopes. And antelopes vary across a spectrum from those that eat nothing but grass to those that eat nothing but browse, like especially fruits, and everything in between, mostly grass, mostly browse, and so on. And when you plot out antelopes, complexity versus anisotropy, the it, there is a strikingly beautiful, more beautiful in mo than in most cases in biology, separation that perfectly matches predictions. But back to primates for a minute. Our predictions would be that a tough food specialist would have a lot of simple surfaces that are anisotropic, hard object specialist, complex surfaces that are isotropic, and a hard object fallback feeder would have mostly simple surfaces, but a few out towards that hard object extreme. That's our prediction. So even if the teeth of this sooty manga bee from Thai look exactly like the teeth of this great cheek manga bee from Kabale, their micro or pattern should be different. And in fact, lo and behold, this is what we find, right? So when we look at a silvery langer, a leaf eater, it's got low micro or texture complexity, hard object specialist, high micro or texture complexity soft fruit eater in between. Here's the fun part. When we look at our hard object fallback feeder, it looks pretty much like the soft fruit eater because most of the time it eats soft fruit. But we do get some outliers up here, which are exactly what you would expect of a hard object fallback feeder. So the teeth of these are shaped the same, but the micro patterns are different as expected. So, all right, well, this is great. What can we tell about human evolution based on this? Some folks in your audience may not be that familiar with the human fossil record, but I can tell you that Blaine's academic great-grandfather, Philip Tobias, uh, was known for saying that the hominin fossil record is an embarrassment of riches. And to this point, there have been literally thousands of human of hominins discovered uh, in the fossil record. We can break them into roughly four groups. The first group are putative hominins. They come around the time of the split with chimpanzees. What side of that split before chimp side, human side, something else they're on is open for debate. But they lived between about seven and four and a half million years ago, still in the woodlands of Africa, what was then woodlands. From about four to two million years ago, a little bit more to a little bit less, we've got a group of species called Australopithecus which had in part come down out of the trees, savannas are spreading across Eastern and Southern Africa. Then at about 2 million years ago or so, two and a half, we get um, a fork in the evolutionary road. In one direction, we get this highly specialized group called Paranthropus with big crests on top of their heads, at least the males, big, thick, flat teeth. They seem highly specialized. 
presumably for savanna environments. And in the other direction, by about 28, 25, 28, we get our own biological genus Homo that explodes out into a variety of different species, leaves the African continent, comes down out of the trees, um, teeth get smaller, brains get bigger, you start to get material culture, uh, and so forth. So the traditional view of their diets based on their teeth is that Ardipithecus had sort of modest sized teeth with modestly thin, intermediate thin enamel, a um, little bit of crestiness, kind of what you'd expect of a generic woodland fruit eater. But when you get to Australopithecus and especially Paranthropus, the teeth get larger, the enamel gets thicker, the teeth get flatter. They look like they're becoming progressively more specialized. For Homo, it's kind of a re reversal of trends. The teeth get smaller, the enamel gets thinner, they get a little crestier. And so this has led to this sort of view, starting with a soft, pliant, fruit-eating forest ape, progressively from early to late Australopithecus and into Paranthropus, a, I wouldn't say progressive, we don't say that in paleontology, but increasingly, uh, harder and or more abrasive specialized diet based on what we've seen generally in the teeth with a, this weird offshoot where the teeth are getting smaller, enamel's getting thinner, crests are getting higher, brains are getting larger. We start to see cut marks on bones and stone tools, presumably related to a broader diet, including more meat. All right, well, what does the dental topography have to tell us? When we go back to the dental topography, and here we've got just a clusal slope, gorilla in green, leaf eater, chimp in red, fruit eater. When we add Australopithecus, turns out they have even flatter teeth than chimps, suggesting that they would have been better at hard foods, not as good at tough ones. Paranthropus, even more, even flatter, blunter teeth for hard foods. Interestingly, Homo comes out in between chimps and gorillas, better adapted dentally to tough foods than chimps and hard foods than gorillas. So everything seems to work more or less, but again, think of the buffet. Is it really that simple? What did the food prints tell us? And we've looked at food prints for a whole bunch of different species of hominins. All right, well, here we've got three different sets of hominins, in red, Australopithecus, in blue, Paranthropus, and in green, Homo. This is microware complexity. Lower values are suggestive of softer foods, higher values, perhaps tougher ones, higher values, harder, perhaps brittler ones. First thing to notice is that Australopithecus does not have much evidence for hard, brittle food consumption. Afarensis, the earlier form, has even less evidence than Australopithecus africanus, the later South African form, which shows a little bit more. Paranthropus is bizarre because these creatures have very similar teeth and skulls, but the East African form looks just like its Australopithecus afarensis predecessor, whereas the South African form is all over the map with a broad range of complexity values suggesting a range of foods from hard and brittle to soft and tough. Homo is kind of interesting because we've got Habilis, the earliest one, with a little bit broader range than its Australopithecus predecessors. Then Erectus, Neanderthals, and the lady showing even more of a range of microware texture complexities. So to break this down, for Homo, we start, it seems like we're starting with early Australopithecus to later Australopithecus to early Homo to later Homo with a narrower diet that seems to be coming broader through time, becoming broader through time. Same with Paranthropus, at least to the South African form, but the East African form is totally different. It seems to have a narrower, more specialized diet of tough foods, perhaps based on isotopes, grass products. So here we've got two animals that look it, for all intents and purposes the same, but very different diets, um, kind of like the two different mangabe species. So, all right, what about the biospheric buffet? Just to finish up, fortunately we know something about what the biospheric buffet table was like for these hominins over time, because paleoclimatologists have done an amazing job reconstructing 
the habitats and environments of Africa during the, uh, the, the time of human evolution. And two trends stick out. First, there is a general trend towards cooling and drying over time. And as it turns out, also, which kind of makes sense because the savannas are spreading across the African continent. But in addition, the amplitude of variation back and forth, the swings from warm and wet to cool and dry is increasing over time. And in fact, some people have argued based on some ideas that Rick Potts of the Smithsonian had that what we're seeing in the teeth, the food prints of our own hominin ancestors, particularly the genus Homo, is increasing flexibility given the increasing, um, increasing versatility and flexibility given the increasing variability in habitat and the differences in the changes uh, on the biosphere buffet table. But I can see that I'm pretty much out of time um, now. So I think what I'm gonna do is just say thank you to Blaine and the other hosts for their kind invitation for me to speak to you today, the curators of all of the museums that allowed this research, all the colleagues that I've collaborated with uh, to do this research, and of course the funding agencies that paid for it all. And that's it. All right, thank you. Thank you for not interrupting me too much. <laughs> <laughs> you requested it, so I tried not to. Chris, do you have a question? Uh, well, yeah, I, I can I can start off with some questions. Um, you know, one thing that I, I was thinking about as you're talking about complexity, and it, it's something that always kind of pops up when when I read these papers. How does grit, you know, in the diet? How does that affect complexity and, and isotropy and that sort of thing? I mean, is it something that you can tease apart, or is it something that's a little bit more complicated? That's a big question. It is. <laughs> <laughs> this is the right person to ask. It so. is, sure. And we're <laughs> recording it too. <laughs> That's the million dollar question. It's been, um, it's been the subject of a lot of insider baseball over the, over the past few years, um, working out the impacts of grit and whether food without grit actually even causes micro air. Um, truth be told, there is this, this the grit provides the substrate. The argument that I and my colleagues make is that the pattern itself is not determined by the grit content, but rather by the relative motions of the teeth, okay. right? So in other words, if whether you've got, whether, whether your abrasives are phytoliths or grit or some combination of the two, lignin, whatever, what you're seeing is the pattern of scratches is not being formed by whether or not there's what kind of grit, what kind of abrasive there is, but rather the way the teeth are rubbing past one another and those abrasives are getting dragged along the surface, right? I would not say that a diet that was terrestrial versus one that was arboreal would necessarily, if, if the properties were the same, produce identical microwear patterns, but study after study after study have shown that the differences are not enough to swamp the diet signal. Got it. Right, you may see some differences if, if you cover your um, apples in grit, <laughs> there may be some differences between a grit covered apple and a non grit covered apple, but you're never gonna confuse microware from an apple with microware from grass. I don't know if that answers your question. Perfect, yes, no, th th is, that makes sense. The thing is this whole debate really stems from the different views of how teeth work right, or, or how teeth are designed to work. The traditional view is George Gaylord Simpson's view of teeth as guides. And what microware, George Gaylord Simpson invented microware back in the 1920s. He showed that this direction of scratches on teeth tell you about the directions of movements of those teeth, right? And so people who take a, a Simpsonian or Fuzz Crompton and Karen Heamy perspective on how teeth work, that, that microware is all about that. For people who prefer to think of teeth as tools and take an engineering approach, they get more into the details of exactly how those grit particles are causing the enamel to be worn away. And so this is actually, fundamentally, that's really where this whole issue comes in. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. So it, it, does the scale also play into this? I mean, if you're if you're crunching on, I mean, we think of it as hard versus tough, and grit would definitely be something that is hard. But it's at a scale; it's a, a micro scale, essentially. So it is something more like a final lift or, or something like it potentially. Um, so yeah, I mean, this it, it's it's. I I understand you guys are are probably still uh kind of working it out mm -hmm. um when you let me when you when you come to this conclusion let me know uh. <laughs> well here's, here's all i'll say about that if you go back to earlier slides um you would notice that a hyena and a cheetah are clearly separated they're both terrestrial they're both eating meat that's presumably covered in savanna grit right and the differences, the cheetah being all scratchy with aligned scratches, the hyena being all pity. Um, when you compare that to a, to a monkey that lives in the trees, the one that eats hard nuts versus the one that eats tough leaves and you see exactly the same pattern differences, you're not getting the level of grit up there. Yeah, yeah. So, so it kind of comes back to the, the questions you're asking. Are you asking ecological and diet questions or are you asking functional questions? Is it, and am I getting it right there? Yeah, I guess it's whether you're asking ecological questions or whether you're asking the mechanics of how to tooth wear forms questions. Yeah. yeah. Right. And what I'm interested in is what these animals were eating. And there are enough cases now, my gosh, I'm, I'm writing a review right now of, of microware. If you Google dental microware, you get literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hits over the past few years. And trying to review that's like trying to drink from a fire hose at this point. <laughs> There's so many studies that have demonstrated it over and over and over again and failed to reject the hypothesis that hard foods leave pits and tough ones leave scratches, that it's hard to imagine that that relationship doesn't exist, whether or not um, grit plays into it. Yeah, so grit's kind of an overprint rather than driving the underlying process. Yeah, and numerous yeah. studies on uh, experimental studies on with chewing machines has shown that um, there is a disentanglement of grossware and microware patterning. So in other words, foods that are loaded down with grit can give you the same pattern as similar foods that don't have grit, but the ones loaded down with grit wear significantly more quickly. Hmm. Uh. So okay. that's where your scale difference comes in. So you can have a, a, a antelope tooth that wears really quick or one that wears really slow, depending upon how much grit is in it. But that gross wear does not correlate to the pattern of microwear. Two very mm -hmm. different patterns of gross wear could have the same microware patterning. And this whole thing gets back to the, the questions of years and years and years ago, where researchers um, like Christine Janis and Nico Portelius and all these other folks kept talking about, and my gosh, you can go way, way, way further back than that, back to Cuvier probably, where people were talking about um, whether hypsodontia is, is, can be associated with, uh, with the spread of, of grasses and phytoliths <laughs> or grit on, in more open settings. So it's yeah. all a continuation of the same debate that's been going on for decades, if not centuries. One of my questions that I'm always fascinated about, I start thinking about it from this modern sense of, of where humans are today and, and our teeth. And you know, we were on this trajectory of, in the genus Homo and our, our teeth were developed in this certain way for this particular type of, of diet that we have. But then you know, since we have agriculture and, and now we look at and, and all our sedentism and we look at our teeth and how messed up in many ways, they are functionally. From a dental anthropologist's point of view, can you kind of explain why our teeth are so messed up in many cases today in relation to our diets? Yeah, I actually just a few months ago published a paper in Scientific American on that, huh. that, um, that any of your listeners or readers or, or watchers or what have you, uh, viewers, uh, can just access by Googling my name in Scientific American. Thank you. Um, Basically, there's a mismatch, right? Because our oral environments are not what our teeth evolved for at the moment, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not a big fan of evolutionary medicine, but evolutionary dentistry does kind of make some sense, right? There's two issues. There's caries or 
cavities that we're prone to that you don't see ubiquitous in the fossil record, that you don't see ubiquitous in prehistoric peoples, at least those that precede agriculture. Um, and then there's the dental crowding, your impacted wisdom teeth, the fact that your lower front teeth tend to be pushed together and your upper front teeth tend to jut out in front of the lowers rather than coming edge to edge. So there's orthodontics and there's caries. As far as caries goes, um, the basic argument is that uh, there's something called a caries balance. And basically that caries balance is such that you have two kinds of bacteria in your mouth. You've got things that are um, acidophilic, love acids, lactobacillus, streptococcus mutans, uh, and then things that are um, acidophobic, that don't like acid. Those are other kinds of streptococcus bacteria principally. And throughout evolutionary history, they've been in balance, right? And in fact, if you look across the mammals today, all mammals we've looked at have both types of bacteria and they're kind of, in, they balance one another. But the problem is when you load your teeth up with sugar, the acidophilic bacteria ferment those, the hell out of that, that sugar. And that basically turns the oral environment more acidic, breeds more of the acidophilic bacteria and uh, the, acidic, the, the, the ones that don't like acids, the acidophobic ones basically can't survive. And it, it basically shifts the balance and that's just sort of builds and builds and builds and puts holes in your teeth, okay? Um, so people are starting to solve this problem by doing oral microbiome transfers to, to restore that balance. And when we eat really sugary foods, those with, or those with carbohydrates that the acidogenic bacteria like, that creates this caries problem. As far as the mismatch between your teeth and jaws goes, the basic idea is that our teeth are genetically pre-programmed to be a certain size. There's nothing we can do about that. Mm -hmm. But as any paleontologist can tell you, your bones are not pre-programmed in the sense that the more you load them, the bigger they grow, right? Because the osteoblasts outperform the osteoclasts. And as, and as you are developing, the more you load a bone, the bigger it'll become. So we are designed to have foods that challenge our jaws, hard foods, tough foods, what have you. But those are basically forcing your jaw to become a certain size. Whether you reach that potential or not, it depends upon how, um, how, how, what the stress environment is during development, right? And so all of our ancestors had the appropriate stress environment for the sizes of our teeth and they fit perfectly. But all of a sudden we're eating mush. We're feeding our kids Gerber baby food or whatever baby food, right? <laughs> We're cutting our food with knives and cooking it to soften it, mm -hmm. right? So then what happens is we're not loading our jaws enough. Our jaws don't go to their ultimate potential, but the teeth don't know that. Right. They're genetically programmed. <laughs> so there isn't enough room in our jaws. Our jaws are short for our teeth. The result is in the back, there's not enough room. The molar teeth, the third molars are impacted wisdom teeth. In the front, there's not enough room. In the bottom, they squeeze together. In the top, they jut out in front of the lowers. So this is, this, and not only that, but when your jaw, when your jaw is smaller, your oral cavity is smaller. That leads to sleep apnea because there's not enough room behind your tongue for you to breathe when you're sleeping. So there's all kinds of implications for this mismatch. Yeah, uh, it's and, just fascinating. And it, it makes you think we really should be following uh, a diet, at least in terms of how we eat and what, what we eat, that would be more healthy, you know. Or chew toys. Um, <laughs> chew toys, exactly. Chew toys. Chew uh, toys but, for kids, yeah. There you go. But uh, as you can see, I mean, this is another way in which evolutionary biology can help inform us on what we should be doing today. Yeah, excellent. Well, let's jump over to the audience and see if there are any questions with David. Sure thing. We've got a few questions from our audience here on Facebook. I'm going to start with this one from Charlie. Charlie is one of our students here in ETSU's program. Charlie asks, when, uh, this is, I think, referring back to an earlier part of the talk, when darting the monkeys, 
How is the tooth morphology measured and recorded? Also, is darting a common method for studying teeth of other taxa besides primates? Excellent, excellent questions. Um, most studies of other mammal teeth are museum-based, right? You go to museums and you use their collections. The work on darting monkeys was an attempt to study live animals sort of in the field. There are lots of attempts these days to study especially dental microware of live animals or recently dead animals. Um, an old postdoc of mine, Gildas Merceron, uh, runs a project where he actually uh, is raising sheep, right? The other postdoc, old, other old postdoc of mine, Rob Scott, has been working on a project with pigs and uh, they feed them different kinds of foods with different levels of abrasives. There's a group in Germany doing much the same thing, uh, Ellen Schultz and, and uh, Kaiser and um, Thomas Kaiser. And in fact, um, what we, what we did was we, we, you dart the animals with a, with a dart gun, and then you stand under the tree with a, with a, a hammock, <laughs> and you wait for the thing to fall. It'll fall into the hammock. Uh, <laughs> you pry open its mouth, dry it out, take dental impressions with the same dental impression material that your dentist uses, fill those with plastic with a high-resolution epoxy, and then you use the epoxy as a replica. I hope that answers your question. All right, let's do, we've got another one here. This is from uh, Melissa, another colleague of ours, who asks, what other factors might drive an organism to use fallback foods other than climate? For example, would competition do this? Uh, Melissa says, I could see food being less available for a number of different reasons. Absolutely, absolutely true. Um, Animals tend to prefer food that is easily accessed and highly caloric, right? I mean, that's why we like potato chips and chocolate. Um, when you can't get those, and, and th these are ones that don't tax your teeth. So everybody's gonna eat them if they can, unless they've got some kind of dietary specialization like a, like a specialized gut that can't handle um, those carbohydrates. But so, so everybody's gonna prefer those kinds of foods. When they can't get them for whatever reason, then they'll switch to fallback foods. Those can be, uh, they may not have access to them because of competition. They may not have access to them because of the altitude that they live at and they're just not widely available. They may not have access to them because of phenology, because availability is seasonal. Uh, they may not have access to them because climate has changed. So there's any number of reasons. But you know, we kind of believe that climate change often drives evolution. Uh, we try not to be, um, you know, uh, environmental determinists, but oftentimes it does, and we can we can frequently test that. And in fact, just one more quick point: um, this former postdoc, Gildas Mercerand, did an amazing paper a few years ago on on fossil deer, and he was able to actually see changes in microwear patterning with the advance and retreat of glaciers in, in Europe during the Pleistocene. And it, it, it perfectly mapped onto it. So it does seem that at least in some cases, diet does change with, with habitat and environment. Very interesting. All right, we've got one more question from our audience. Uh, VJ wants to know, how does bite force factor into all of these things? We don't know. That's a really good question. How does bite force factor into these things? Um, presumably it does, <laughs> uh, but we don't really have a, a firm handle on that. Some people study bite force. They look at, but when they do, people like Paul Constantino um, have looked at bite force. Uh, people like um, Peter Lucas and Brian Lawn have looked at bite force. And what they typically do is they'll look at the sizes of antemortem um, flakes that have been that have been flaked off the tooth. You know, if you bite into something really hard, sometimes you'll take a little flake off your tooth. And the more force is gen that's generated, the larger the flake. And if the flake, if the area remaining area is rounded, you can suggest that it's antemortem. It's before death. 
So some people have started to look at bite force that way, but as far as its impact on microware, we just don't know. Do you know if anybody's looked at bite force versus enamel thickness? Because bears for, bears, for example, just have incredibly thin enamel, mm -hmm. which is sort of surprising to me. Hmm. Well, that's probably a legacy of, of their carnivorous past. Right. Right. Um, yeah, no, I don't. Uh, some people have looked at the relationship between bite force and enamel thickness, right? Particularly for primates and bats. Betsy Dumont did that years and years ago, and she suggested there was a strong relationship. Um, some people have, you know, looked at the, the general morphology of the outer surface, the enamel cap, to the underlying dentin cap, and the way the horns are made up. And they talk about you know, the different properties of the enamel and the dentin, and the fact that you know, this strengthens the tooth to have the flexibility in the dentin with more collagen, but the hardness of the enamel on the outside. I think also what we need to, to remember is that thin enamel can be an adaptation, not just thick enamel. So it may be that you want to penetrate that enamel to create sort of angular surfaces where the enamel and the dentin meet, because it gets scooped out. Uh, leaf eaters tend to have that. So there's lots of lots of open questions about that. All right. Well, we better wrap it up. If there anything else, David, coming in or any questions you have that you wanted to throw in at the very end? That's it. Uh, just a thanks to everybody who joined us today. Thanks for watching and thanks for asking those great questions. All right. Well, thank you again for joining us, Peter. Really enlightening. Great to see you. Good to see you. All right, bye-bye.